Hello, welcome to Legislative Digest, a very special edition with the Solutions Caucus. We have three critical members of this Solutions Caucus, and we'll find out what that means here momentarily. I want to thank each of you for coming to Helena Civic Television. A lot of people in this capital city community, um, they may know you because they watch you on TV, but they may not. So we'll start with introductions, self-introductions. So, Representative Jones, who are you and where are you from? Uh, well, obviously, I'm Lou Jones. I'm from North Central Montana. I'm a small businessman from up in that area. I uh, own a number of businesses and uh, have been active in the legislature, I guess, for 14 years. Representative Balance. And I'm Nancy Balance from uh, Ravalli County in the Bitterroot uh, on, the, on the west side of Montana. I've uh, been in the legislature this is actually my fourth term. Mm -hmm. My name is Eric Moore. I'm from Miles City. I'm a farmer and rancher by trade when I'm not here, and I first came to the legislature in 2011, and this is my first term in the House. Yeah. So thanks again for coming. And as people will already note, that you are veteran legislators, and that's probably wh why you have formed the Solutions Caucus. You've spent some time in the Senate, both of you, and now you're <coughs> in the House. So uh, you've got a lot of experience with this process. So let's begin with just a brief explanation of what the Solutions Caucus means. What, what is the group, what, what's its origin and evolution to date? Well, it's, it's had an interesting origin and evolution. I, uh, it it uh, came into being largely out of a, um, a group of folks, and, and, and folks that have watched the history here will share with you that uh, Representative, then Senator Moore, and I have been on the opposite side of a number of issues, sometimes at a height of heated level, as have <laughs> Representative Balance and I. But what we started finding out was that uh, we had a passion, and the passion was for actually solving the problems. And we weren't angry at each other about sound bites. We were actually willing to debate and try to find a solution to real problems. And our goal was to uh, ultimately work to, to make a difference. And we all came from a conservative viewpoint. We all certainly had different point of views, and we spent a lot of time even today debating. We don't, we don't uh, hold it against each other when we don't agree, but we are, tend to be united in getting around the table, defining what exactly is the problem, and figuring out is there a pathway to solving the problem. And to be honest, if you're on appropriations or finance and claims, I guess I was first on appropriations, then on finance and claims, now back on appropriations, uh, if, you're, if you're in the numbers world, we have a requirement to have a, a constitutional requirement for a balanced budget. And so uh, we are forced to make those spending decisions, those cut decisions, those to prioritize and make some difficult choices. We have to solve the problem. And in doing so, it often sorts us into a, a different group because we do vote yes on some funding, funding deals. We do make decisions that, that if you're from the outside looking in, could you have just said no? So we are united in our ability to, our ability and our willingness to put in the time, do the work to solve real problems for Montana. Yeah. Well, I should mention, I mean, people will know you're all Republicans. You're in the majority. There are different factions within the majority party from time to time, in all parties, of course. Uh, and it's refreshing, actually, as a citizen to know that such a coalition within the majority party exists because we're all looking for those solutions. Now, you've already touched on a major subject that most people will know, but not everyone, and that is that constitutionally, the only job the legislature must do, must accomplish, is the budget. And balance it as well, which is two things. But it's all about the budget, and that's really what we're going to talk about mostly today. In future episodes, we'll talk about other big issues, but today we'll focus on the budget. So, Representative Balance, you're chair of the House Appropriations Committee, and you, I think you share that title or, or not? We, we tried that a little bit differently this time around, and we actually are sharing that title this time. Uh, in 2015 and 2017, I did, did chair the Appropriations Committee, uh, so I've been around for a bit. Um, and uh, as, as you probably know, and it, and it fits very well, with we actually call ourselves the Conservative Solutions Caucus, uh -huh. because one of the things that we try to do, um, the budget has to be balanced. 
but we come from the Republican side of the House, and we look for the solutions that are the most conservative we can make them, but still know that we can get the votes we need both in the House and the Senate and can also be signed by the governor. So before the governor comes with his budget, as you know. That's where it all starts, that. right? Well, actually it doesn't because oh. we work the entire interim talking about the things that we want to accomplish. Uh, at least we as a solutions caucus do. We talk about the things that we want to accomplish within the budget. So although the governor presents the first formal budget, uh, we have uh, an idea of exactly where we want to go with it as well. Okay, so you start well-informed about your own priorities. We, we do, and we plan, uh, and, and we we think very um, long and hard about the things that we want to accomplish within that budget. Yeah. Now, now I have to say, watching the Appropriations Committee this session and in many sessions prior, there's sort of a ritualistic look and feel to it in that in most cases, not every, and that's where the solutions come in, there's at least two, you, you have a majority of votes on the committee. So when, when, when an issue is debated and there's public comment and there's testimony and then there, you call for a vote and then there's a roll call vote and you can bet your bottom dollar what the end result is most of the time. So my question, you know, that, that's just probably a function of being in the majority. You kind of know you're going to get this vote tally. I guess my question is, is it more than just ritual? Like, can you say how important it is each time those votes are taken in terms of the process and the legitimacy of the process? Yeah, I, I think that when you take those votes in appropriation, um, as, as Chair Balance said, we are a conservative solutions caucus, so there's going to be a lot of things that we're not going to agree with our Democratic colleagues on. Um, actually, when you look both either at appropriations, probably more so appropriations in the earlier uh, points of the session, but if you look at the House floor, a lot fewer votes are on party lines than you would think. Um, I think last time I looked was Senate data was back, it was less than 20% are actually on party line votes. Now there's a lot of bills that are what we call housekeeping bills, changing statute to conform with changes in federal law, things like that. But there's a lot of uh, of bills that I would say are are bipartisan in a lot of ways. And we are conservatives, but our caucus is more about ideology, or I'm sorry, I said that wrong, more about methodology than it is ideology. It's about putting together working coalitions, uh, usually with members of our own party, but there's there's Democrats who, who want to solve problems as well. And, and we work with the people who are interested in solving solutions. And obviously we lobby as, as much to the right as we can get, but it's about getting a solution that a Democrat governor will sign. And it's all the other thing I think that makes our, our little sub caucus unique. It's not so little, but our, our group is that we believe in, in incrementalism. And I think one of the mm -hmm. tragedies of term limits is you basically only have one working year on the job. Four 90 day sessions is roughly 360 days, and then you're out. So people want to come here and change the world in four mm -hmm. sessions, one working year on the job. And that's just not, that's not the way government works and not the way it should work. Government needs some stability. So we focus on if, if, a, if a five or a 10 yard gain is as good as we can get, we'd love to have a touchdown pass, but we'll take a five or a 10 yard gain if that's all that can be had because it's making progress, incremental progress towards where we want to get. Yeah, and the whole procedure, whole process within the constitutional order of things is to prevent radical change. It is. It's, you can't really achieve radical change within the guidelines and the rules and, and the principles embedded in the constitution. Um, you, you've kind of answered several questions that I was planning to ask, but one of them is how, how many people are in the caucus, on you know, in the House and on the Senate? How, how do you count yourselves up? Or is it a kind of a fungible thing? It moves it, around. It, it moves. does move around. It does move Depends around. And uh, people, um, it, it's not as formal as it sounds. It's a group of people who... Uh, like to get together and solve problems. So uh, at any given time, there may be someone that says, I, I need some help with something. And uh, we rally people around to try and solve those problems. And how do you accomplish the task of working across the aisle? Because you, you need to, you don't always need votes from the other party, but you need the governor ultimately. What's, what's it like to work across the aisle when you're in the majority? How does that how does that look and feel? Because I don't think that's something the public 
know as much about. It's, you know, it's we don't a lot see of it. personal <clears throat> relationships that you develop over time. Um, it, it's it's not uh, sitting around a table on a specific issue necessarily and solving it, but it's relationships that you make over time and a willingness to sit down and talk about any issue. Uh, I don't think there's any issue that this Conservative Solution Caucus isn't willing to sit down and gather a group together and have several working sessions to try and come out with an outcome that can be achieved and that is as conservative as we can make it, but still uh, does the right things for Montana. Let's then kind of zero in on House Bill 2, the, the, the big budget bill. I know there, there are other appropriations measures that sort of surround House Bill 2, but this is the main, the main engine, and you've successfully completed your work in the House Appropriations Committee. So the next place it goes, and that's very shortly from now, is to be debated on the House floor. We can presume, I think, safely that it's going to pass the House floor. Then it goes over to the Senate. Maybe I, I'm speculating. You never it know. usually does. You never know. <laughs> eventually. eventually it does. Eventually, 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 eventually it always does. Eventually. It has yeah. to. But the, the substance of House Bill 2 is, I mean, that's where most of the money is, and a lot of people will will remember earlier budget directors and others saying, you know, the main task of the legislature in House Bill 2 is to educate, medicate, and adjudicate, or incarcerate. incarcerate. I guess it's yeah. incarcerate. <laughs> um, so do you want to just spend a little bit of time, each of you, about the substance of House Bill 2 now and how you would characterize those, those areas of sure. expenditure and how they relate to each other and what's dominant issue of, of this session. Sure, and I, and I would just say first that um, uh, we do work it backward by figuring out where we believe we need to be. Uh, we have subcommittee chairs for five major subcommittee areas, uh, and and two, the two um, largest areas are right here at this table now, which is education and health care. Um, so um, I, th I think those two chairmen can tell you as much as you'd like to know about those two areas, but they are the big ones. Uh, for, first thing, though, that we do is, is figure out uh, how much money we really have to spend, and, and we work it backward from knowing where we want to end up, uh, and then we kind of carve out some for some things that we believe big uh, projects that may or may not pass. Uh, things like Medicaid expansion and um, uh, pre-K and infrastructure and the things that the governor had in his budget, those may also pass, so we make sure we have room for those. But then the first 45 days is spent digging into the detail in each of the five major areas. And in those subcommittees, that's where the bulk of public testimony occurs. Yes. People mm -hmm. who have needs or, you know, demands and requests, that's where you hear them and speak yes. with them directly. Mm -hmm. They do show up again sometimes in the full House Appropriations Committee. Mm -hmm. But um, mm, where, where, where are you at now? Oh, let me, no, let me back up. I think you mentioned it. You need to, you start with what you know revenue will support. So what's the instrument that sort of sets that in place for you to, to begin all this work? Right. Well, um, first we sit down and, and um, talk about uh, structural balance and ending fund uh, and reserve. So um, a couple of sessions ago, we kind of separated an ending fund into real ending fund balance and a reserve fund. So we know where we need to end. Uh, and then we within each subcommittee, we look at changes that we may or may not want to make. Um, and, th and this time was a little bit different, and I think Lou can probably talk about that well in terms of uh, the way we looked at the staffing um, was a much deeper look than we typically take, staffing of agencies. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was one of the key agencies. areas for us this time. Every session is a little different, but that's where we headed this time. Yeah, well, go ahead and, and you use some key terms that we need a little bit further explication on. Structural balance... Yep. Ending fund balance and okay. reserve. Those yep. three, we need to better understand sure. what those are and why they're so significant. So, all right, so let's begin with the definitions because that matters. Ending fund balance is effectively the money that you need to have left in the account 
to uh, the cash flow in government, the spending doesn't come in smooth. So it has money comes in during the tax time, then flows out. You have to have somewhere around $200 million, about 8.3% of the total left in the bank in order to have adequate cash flow and to provide a small amount of reserves to in order to be able to go through just the the regular cycle. You, you and I know 200 million sounds like a large number to folks, but you got to remember this is a 14 billion dollar spender. 200 million is is not necessarily a large number if you put that in the terms. It's the money you need to have on hand to be able to go through the ebbs and flows. So so that's the ending fund balance. Beyond that, we we and, and we keep it in reserve, but we also keep some additional reserves, right? In a budget stabilization reserve account, which is a effectively a, a savings account, yeah, I guess to put it in real terms, we set some money alongside for a savings for an unpredicted event like a recession. We also have to take a look at what is always an unexpected spend, but can be a reserve at times if it doesn't occur, and that's a fire season. Mm-hmm. So we put some money aside for fire and and some emergency funds. So first we look at what we have to set aside and just keep on hand to survive. And then there's a revenue estimate, right? You're, we, we, uh, a lot of folks know what their paycheck is every month. We get to have a two-year estimate. So we kind of know. We hope we know. And, and you have and, that in advance of the session, slightly. Right? Yeah, we, we get a revenue estimate before the session. It's updated throughout the session. But I want you to imagine a, a state of this size with, with all sorts of, of effects, and the butterfly effects. I get little things happen here and yeah. there. We have to try to predict revenue two years out. And, and so we, we have to have a revenue, and we have a reserve, and what we get to operate on is what exists in between. You know, and so uh, that, that is the terminology. The, 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 so basically, what is, what is House Badoo? It's the prioritization of money with scarcity, the prioritization of, of desires with scarcity. Mm-hmm. In every single section, left on its own, education could present Enough key ideas, good ideas, potentially things you'd love to fund if money was unlimited, but it would consume this entire budget. Section B, your nursing homes, all the all the the, the help with some of the most vulnerable in society, the, the critical work Section B does, could consume the entire budget if left alone. There aren't too many advocates for incarceration, right? There's not a lot of folks come in and argue for prisons, but there is a desire to... Uh, to keep the community safe, and we do have a recognition that, you know, you probably shouldn't have everybody leave and turn the lights out at night. You may return to a negative event. (laughs) So we continue to uh, try to take what is a limited resource. I continue to say money is scarce, and we try to do the best job we can with different perspectives from 150 different legislatures and from an executive prioritizing that resource against all of the areas, the sub, and we break it into what we call rice bowls. So within each area, I happen to do education this time. Uh, uh, we did, Folks split up into, in, in the rice bowls. You prioritize. We, we allot what we feel then based upon the first calculation can be spent in that rice bowl, that area. Then we try to do with first within that area, do the absolute best job we can do prioritizing the needs of that area. Uh, and then, and then, of course, ultimately, the areas all come together, and we prioritize across them. You know, and and I don't know if at this point you want to go into an area or where you want to head, but well, actually, the magnitude of the numbers aside, you're, it's is very helpful in terms of how I should be thinking about my household finance. <laughs> I mean, really, these basic <laughs> concepts of you know, you have some in reserve, yeah. you have a cash flow need. The only thing, I guess, I'd turn to you to elaborate just a little bit to finish this out on the structural balance. What, what does that mean, <clears throat> structural balance? The structural balance is simply ongoing revenues versus ongoing expenses. Are we structurally, it, it is like your household budget. Your household budget, you look at how much you have in the bank, how much you have in the savings account, but are you spending $300 more per month than your paycheck is? You might have $10,000 in the bank so you could live like that a long time. You could say then that you're balanced, but you're not structurally balanced because your ongoing revenues are less than your ongoing expenses. That's yeah. what structural balance is. Okay. Well, with respect to ongoing revenues, I think you've made it very clear you're ideologically conservative. You, you want to work towards solutions, and you have to work across the aisle to achieve those. But the, your, your opposition is all about, well, there's not enough 
money. I mean, yes, it's always going to be a scarce resource, but it could be less scarce if you went along with some proposals to either increase taxes in some area or apply new taxes in some area. So we might as well just kind of cut to the chase about the conservatism that you manifest here and, and the philosophy that underscores where you're at with respect to the budget. Yeah, and uh, that's, a, that's a good point because uh, we, we kind of come in, all of us uh, as legislators, uh, with some very biased views, ideological views. I, I think almost everyone does. Uh, and then, as Eric said earlier, if you live through a couple of appropriation sessions, you learn very quickly that if there is not some give and take, you won't get the work done. So although we do start with our ideological uh, biases and, and conservative by nature, so our uh, initial take is, no, we are not going to raise taxes. If anything, we would lower them. Uh, and the way we would do that is, in some areas, cut mm -hmm. spending. Uh, then I, I think the other side comes in with an opposite um, uh, viewpoint, where they would raise taxes in order to spend on the things that they believe, according to their ideology, that, that we should spend on as a state uh, and as a society. So finding that middle ground can be very tough. Mm -hmm. um, as a solutions caucus, we attempt to do exactly that, but we still try to keep our conservative view first and foremost and push it that direction if we can. Um, so our, our first take is that can we do, can we meet the obligations of the state uh, without raising taxes? That's the first question we always yeah. ask. Yeah. Okay. I want to, I hope I can pose this question in a non-ideological and certainly a non-partisan way. You know, when I observe much of the testimony that you receive, especially in the health care arena, mm -hmm. social and health-related uh, service needs, I think, okay, I know that our state is, is aging rapidly, mm -hmm. and then presumably that's going to increase the demand for health services, let's put them all together in that category, that are expected... Of government, in other words, uh, maybe there's a vibrant private sector solution to the needs of aging people. I mean, I'm one of them, so I'm, I'm thinking about myself. So, how could how do you address that kind of demographic phenomenon? And it's kind of a two part question. Like, how how do you deal with that if if people are going to be demanding higher levels of services and they're going to expect it of the government? How do you deal with that with respect to your budget priorities and, and, and not raising taxes? And then the other question, which we can get to in a little bit, is is there an appetite within the Solutions Caucus for tax reform, structural changes to the tax system mm -hmm. to make it maybe easier to adjust to these demographic realities that are just not going to go away? So I'm throwing a lot out there. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start on the on the – taking care of the most vulnerable among us, which is what Section B, Health and Human Services, does. It is the largest spender of all funds in state government. About 43 cents out of every dollar state and federal we spend in Montana goes through my subcommittee. Um, and I think being part of the Solutions Caucus is asking the right questions. Um, we, we had a sort of vigorous debate with the administration on that here just recently when House Bill 2 was, was heard in committee. But it's, it's looking for efficiencies and it's asking the right questions. So when we talk about the, the graying of Montana as we all know is, is happening, you know, it's how can we most effectively deliver care? Is there care, you know, in-home care, community-based care is cheaper than institutional care. How can we, how can we increase that degree of cares? In terms of management of the department, we had a, a big debate with the um, department about uh, vacancies. They had 400 vacant positions. We cut 100 of them and redirected that money to 100 that had been vacant for over a year, I might add. And we redirected that money towards community-based services. The more services we can provide in the community, the less people go into institutions. It's cheaper, and it's most people would prefer that as well. So just to, not to interrupt mm -hmm. too much, but community-based services, does that mean like private nonprofit entities contracted with the state to provide services rather than having direct service from a government entity? It is does. That, is that pretty it much does. it? Yep, that, okay. that's what it is. It's in-home services. It's it's uh, partial care as opposed to full care. You know, in elderly populations, it's in-home services as opposed to full nursing home care, which is pennies on the dollar. But a lot of when we talk about how to balance the budget, it's it's 
we've used some home examples of, of the state budget like your household budget, but it's not the same in a, a couple of different ways. One is that we are driven by population drive. We don't get to, you know, three months before the biennium ends, Child Protective Services doesn't get to switch off the intake phone line because we're out of money, right? The uh, uh, elementary school doesn't get to turn 15 kids away because, oh, that's all we budget for. We have to take all the population that comes. It's a little more predictable in K-12 because it's just population. In DPHHS, it is aging demographics. It's our methamphetamine yeah. epidemic, which yeah. has put, put our Child Protective Services strain that budget to the to the max so it's constantly asking the right questions and looking for creative solutions finding efficiencies wherever you can yeah um do i have it wrong then that is is it is it medicate educate incarcerate is that the the order there's proper order of the big trio uh depending on how you classify it, health and human services is a large if you throw state and federal dollars together Health and Human Services is the biggest spender Gen because we have a lot of federal match through Medicaid, so we get a lot of money in my section from the federal government. Um, general fund, basically income tax, state revenue is mostly spent in education. 51%. Yeah. Okay. Now, as you said already, House Bill 2 is, has survived uh, the, the committee, House Appropriations Committee. It will be debated on the floor very shortly. What happens then? Can you just kind of describe the future of the big budget bill for the duration of the session? So twofold things. First, I, I don't want to leave the ta uh, tax question without finishing where yeah. you began, yeah. which is uh, there's a, even, even with the existing taxes we have, because the tax of a value of the state, areas like Bozeman, Helena, folks are building increasing tax value in these areas. So the property tax continues to generate more dollars, even without increasing the amount. The income tax generates more income even at today. So it isn't that the income's held flat. The our tax collections are increasing at about four percent. Personal income grew in in the state about five percent on average the last fifteen years. There's a steady increase coming in the general fund of about four percent. Cost, uh, you know, when you look at uh, inflation and and the CPI, it's about three percent. So the the concept that we are not seeing an increased dollars coming to government is not true. The question would be, is the amount being received sufficient to in cover the increased cost of provision of services or the change in requirements of services? To the extent possible, we, we try to make sure what I will say that the hat and the head are growing at the same right rate, that we we aren't we, we are providing the critical services we need within the, the 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 growth increase. As for reform of taxes, that's an entire different conversation, correct? Yeah. There's could we could yeah. hold a debate about the number of units of taxes we should collect, and you might feel twelve hundred is appropriate units. I might feel one thousand. They both might feel eight hundred. Would we consider and discuss a reform that that more effectively distributes a given amount across the the different economy, the change in economies? Absolutely, we do recognize that the natural resource economy, which has long been Montana's base, is not the base it used to be. We recognize that there is an increase in the service economy, in, in, in penetration in particular in rural areas of like the Amazons, the Netflixes. Yeah. We understand that is occurring. We understand there's a big retirement and investment income economy come to the state, such as in Big Sky, in, in the Yellowstone Club, in, in those areas. We see this happening. We are willing, and in fact, it was the finance committee that began engaging in. In fact, some of the charts that are here on this table came, just happened to be hauled with me from a discussion of how do we engage in the discussion, not about the amount collected, but are we equitably distributing the burden given that the economy is different today? I would suggest we are not. The difficulty in holding that conversation becomes one of if every time you raise it, then people just assume you want to increase taxes. Yeah. You know, and, and so you continue to have to remind them if you do absolutely nothing, in particular in the property tax work, in the rural, so one more store closes, one more store goes away, there's one less payer. Given that the property taxes spent locally are all by local government, they haven't changed, you are going to see a drastic increase simply because of the deletion of the number of payers through attrition as each flower shop closes, replaced by 
an Amazon, for instance, that potentially is not participating in yes. this economy. Mm -hmm. So we are very, very willing to engage in a, in a conversation of what is the appropriate reform. With a clear understanding by reform, we don't mean looking to increase taxes merely to, to uh, potentially consider if, it, if there's a fair distribution of burden. Yeah. I, I hope I said that. No, I, I follow you, and thanks for bringing us back to the question I launched out there and then let go of too soon. <laughs> That's, you've made it very clear, and, and it raises just another kind of side question in my mind about what happens, what's happening in our state, and it, it isn't happening rapidly, but it seems almost inevitable that as the population ages, the economy, the structure of the economy shifts towards more reliance on, on services and even manu like a renaissance of manufacturing, high tech, that the rural areas, and this affects health care spending too, there's going to be this, imp this pressure to consolidate into urban areas. In other mm -hmm. words, not full-scale abandonment of small towns and areas, but just the, the <coughs> pressures to sustain small rural com communities are just increasing. I know this may be a little bit beyond the topic of the budget, mm -hmm. but it seems like that's a, that's a struggle you ha have to work with as you prioritize. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's a big struggle. You can see a lot of C schools, class C schools in my district that are struggling to even stay C. And it's not so much that our productivity in those areas is decreasing, because it's not. It's simply technology and efficiencies. I mean, a classic example in my operation, I used to have to hire somebody in the summer to run around and check all the pivots on a four-wheeler mm -hmm. and make sure they weren't stuck or they weren't plugged and whatever. And now I pull this up. I say, morning, every pivot says good morning back, and, the, and, and if one's not running, it tells me, and then I go out and look at it. But, I mean, I've saved a, a position, and there's thousands of examples of that. So it just doesn't take as many people in the ag industry as it did even 20 years ago. Ag, timber. I mean, across the natural resources, ag. Uh, one tractor, Uber 5, used to be timber. Everybody can look up and find the big tree harvesting machine that, that's replaced any number of loggers. So the logging industry will not be the same. As productivity and tech, technology has changed the world. And as technology increases, the workforce decreases, and, and to the extent the workforce is natural resource and rural, you know, I, it, it takes far less of the huge mining trucks with tires bigger than you than it did little trucks, far less of the great big caterpillars than it did big caterpillars, far less operators. So the world is shifting, and technology is impacting the workforce needs in government, too. It, it, you know, uh, back when you had to do all your calculations by hand, you needed more people doing it than when a computer's doing it. Yeah. So one of the reasons we can talk to and control some workforce size at government is just like technology has impacted the private sector, requiring less people to produce enhanced output, to be honest. So, so that, that impact incurs in government. Yeah. As this computer systems and, and, and new technology comes to bear, we find that we are, we are seeing actually the, the um, and you've got to separate FTE, which is slots, right? The FTE is the available slots for hiring workforces who is hired, but we are seeing the total FTE, the total slots required to operate this government, has flatlined and actually decreased some, even though it's producing more outcomes, yeah. but it has required a significant investment in technology to do so. All right. So productivity has is increased. as important in government as it is anywhere else. And we should and, expect And that's it. what yeah. people are striving for is a higher degree of productivity. And we should we should expect that in our government just like the private sector demands of each other of each of itself through competition. Okay, so now let's go segue back to <laughs> House Bill 2 and and its destiny and, from and this day and forward. And what's next? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's and, um, what people to sure. should expect Sure, and, and we did uh, pass it out of the Appropriations Committee, and it was on pretty much a party-line vote, which we always expect pretty much at that, at that point in time. Uh, it will be on the floor of the House on Tuesday. Uh, our hope would be that it passes out of the House and then moves on to the Senate, where the Senate Finance uh, and Claims Committee will do the same thing we did. They will, they will hear every section of the bill, and they will vote on it and then put it on the Senate floor. Yeah. And we are hoping that uh, they don't make more changes than we can accept. Uh, if they do, then we go into a conference committee and resolve those issues. Yeah. 
So that I could say that's probably <clears throat> inevitable. Yeah, a conference co committee is always the end result. Uh, well, maybe not all. Last session we did not. Yep. In yeah, actually, yeah, in seventeen we did not. That was like a miracle. I think it budget. took everyone by surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> except us. Settled that <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a flash. Yeah, yeah. And those don't happen by accident. Do you have to plan them pretty carefully to make that happen? Yeah. So yeah. Well, um, we're stretching into the last few minutes of our allotted time. Uh, I do want to just comment before I forget that witnessing the process that you are all engaged in, watching the House Appropriations Committee, even though I've already spoken to is the seeming ritual of it all, you know, the minority raises amendments and they go down by the same vote every time. Aside from that, the civility that's on display there is noticeable. It's remarkable. And that's so not happening in other arenas of politics. It's very refreshing. <laughs> Even though it might be kind of dull from times or you know, predictable, you obviously ha have respect for one another. And I'm speaking directly to you because I know your, your counterpart, uh, uh, Representative Caffaro, you have a lot of uh, arguments, but they're principled and civil arguments. And that's just kind of fun to watch. You know, we get all... Take a lesson from that. Yeah, Representative Bowen spoke earlier about how you, how you make good government, and it comes through two things. It comes to relationships, and it comes to hard work. Mm -hmm. And Representative Caffaro and I probably don't agree on anything, but I trust her. She trusts me. We can speak frankly. We don't lie to each other. And when we sit down to discuss a budget or a bill, we don't focus on what can't you do. We focus on what can you do. And if you spend enough time poking the problem from different areas, you can almost always get to a place that neither one of you are crazy about, but you both can live with, and yeah. the world keeps spinning. Well, that's palpable. I just want to tell you that. It, it's noticeable from afar, and in, in the abstract, even. Well, you begin with the, the understanding, I guess. We, we all begin with the thought process that no one, and that's part of being the Solution Caucus, I recognize that I certainly don't, I'm not the expert on all subjects, and there's people that know far more than I, and I don't just assume people on one side of the aisle no more than I. That, uh, for instance, on water issues, I turn to Brad Hamlet all the time. It's his area of expertise. He focuses on it. He cares deeply about it. And so uh, a lot of the times I'm more inclined to uh, to uh, follow Hamlet on a water issue than almost any other person. Uh, there's respect Jim Keene. Uh, there's no doubt in this legislature, in people's mind, that Jim Keene wants work on the ground. That's who he is. Mm -hmm. So we, we listen to him when he speaks about stuff that is work on the ground. Uh, Sesso, I mean, there's any number of those. Ryan Lynch. So, no, we get along absolutely famously with the, the other folks. We don't always, by get along, I mean we don't always agree on every subject, but uh, we recognize they're sincere they are bringing a viewpoint from those folks they represent and elected them, and that in, in many instances, their viewpoint impacts the decisions we make, the solutions we achieve all the time. So the, the thought process is just because you're elected from a different area, a different constituency, that you're not knowledgeable is not one I would think almost anyone in the Solution Caucus holds. We, we all recognize and work with I've worked with John Sesso on budgets now for for well more than a decade, and everyone here well, would tell One you. of the other things that the Solutions Caucus does very, very well is if someone brings up an issue, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, someone brings an issue, uh, and, and we're not quite sure where to take it and there aren't any bills that cover it, uh, we just pull a group of people together, we start conversations, we dig in as deeply as we can, even in the middle of the session, which is difficult to do. It's hard to find time to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we try to find everybody who's interested in the topic, bring them together, have the conversation, uh, so that at the very least we talk it all the way through. And, and I think that that's so important to uh, getting anything of value done or anything that is sustainable over time. Yeah. Now, would it be fair to say, and I think it won't be, that the Conservative Solutions Caucus from time to time actually does include informally members of the other party? Oh, or, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay, all the so time. All the time. Yeah, all the time. Not yeah. Part of As the time we discuss time. and have work groups, um, yeah, you'll, you'll find uh, members of both parties in there. Because if we don't, then, then you lose half the conversation. 
Yeah. And, and then you come out with solutions that can't be passed, and then they're nothing more than sound bites. Well, as, as, as we were talking before we started the show, there will be future episodes, I hope, where we'll address the, the other big topics of the session, Medicaid expansion, infrastructure, and some education, uh, kind of a, a composite of education issues. But before we go, I want to make sure each of you in your own light and right has the last word on anything about the budget that you'd like people to know now. I mean, you know, it's still early days in a way, but outside of House Bill 2, are there other appropriation measures, spending measures that you'd want people to be alerted to now? Outside of 2? Yeah. I'm yeah, there, there are some major policy issues that are not covered in House Bill 2, and that was intentional. Uh, but we did leave uh, room for them within the budget um, so that we made sure that House Bill 2 was small enough that we could accommodate in the budget the big things that are being talked about that may pass. So big policy issues such as Medicaid expansion, uh, such as uh, career and, and uh, technical education, yeah. um, uh, in, um, Infrastructure. special education, special, ed uh, special needs um, yeah, infrastructure is not covered in House Bill 2, and yet we had to make sure that House Bill 2 is small enough that if those policies pass, that there's room for them in the overall budget. I understand. Well, if unless you have more to add, I want to thank you again for being here and explaining things very clearly. Uh, I hope our viewers appreciate that. We certainly all appreciate the hard work that you do, and we know that really you have the tougher jobs because the budget is a reflection of the state's values and priorities, mm -hmm. and there's a, more demand than there is supply. The scarcity Always. of resources is a reality. I think we all have to come to grips with that. So I look forward to the next time we get together uh, with you three and perhaps a few others, and um, it'll Great. be fun. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks thank for having us. Thank yeah. you for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you for watching. <laughs>